every half db counts. So Drew Oliver recently did a video for Isotope where he analysed some of the top 50 Billboard songs from February 2025 and shared what he found. For example, he analysed things like loudness and the EQ profiles of the songs. Then he went to some of the more interesting outliers that he noticed. And in particular, he talked about the song Too Sweet by Hosier, where he noticed a discrepancy in the peak levels through the song. So at certain sections in the song, the peak level would bump up by a small amount. And that's unusual because normally if you're using a limiter right at the end of the chain, you'll see similar peak levels at all points, unless there's one section where it's really quiet and the peaks aren't getting anywhere near the limiter. You'll typically see a consistent peak level throughout the song, especially when they're mastered fairly loud. In this case, there were certain sections where the peak level increased, and Drew had an interesting theory about why that might be. He suggested that the engineer was deliberately gaining up the song at certain points after the limiter in order to get extra loudness without changing the amount of limiting that happens, because if you push the level up before the limiter, you'll get more limiting for the louder section of the song. That is an interesting idea, and I can't say for sure whether it's correct or not, but my immediate reaction was to have a different interpretation. In fact, I can think of a few different reasons that we might be seeing the peak level bump that Drew noticed, and I thought you might be interested if I explained what they were. And I'm going to start with what I consider to be the most likely explanation based on my experience as a mastering engineer over the years, and that's just that the mix was probably already pushed quite loud, quite possibly into a limiter or a maximizer of some kind, and that the mastering engineer decided that actually it would be nice to have a little bit more contrast between the verse and chorus, and that's why they added the automation. So rather than deliberately adding extra limiting to leave headroom through most of the song and then automating after the limiter, I suspect the whole thing was still going into a peak limiter, was probably not being made any louder, because often these days mixes are coming in already very loud, as loud as we would normally master them. So if there's no need to add extra limiting, I think it's more likely that the rest of the song, the verses, were actually turned down. So the end result is the same, but the reason is to compensate for a lack of dynamics in the mix. Now, of course, as I say, I can't know whether that's true or not, but it's something that I've seen, something that I do sometimes, and it's something I know that other mastering engineers would also do. I think also we need to look at the waveform itself and consider how the peaks look. You can definitely see the two different sections that Drew is talking about, where there is a difference in the peaks, but actually these peaks are quite spiky. <laughs> Even though they're pushed up hard into a limiter, the song overall I think is at about minus 8 LUFS, so it's a good loud release, even by modern standards. But this doesn't look typical of a final digital limiter to me. And let me just show you what I mean. If I add extra limiting to a short section of the original file, you can see that the peaks are much more tightly controlled. That's just a minus 1 dB threshold, so you can see that these are getting up to minus 0 0.5, 0 0.4, 0 0.3, but the key point is that there's much more variety than I would normally expect to see with a digital limiter. Now, just because the peaks in this track don't look like the digital limiter that I happen to be using for this demo isn't conclusive proof one way or another that there was or wasn't a final limiter on the master of this song. Another possibility is that an analog limiter was being used either during the mix or during the master. And in my experience, an analog limiter is going to similarly not give such a clear maximum level in the way that a digital limiter would and that could well be what we're seeing here. In fact, as an alternative to my alternative idea as to why we're seeing this, potentially this is just how the analog limiter looks when the music is hitting it at different levels. And I, I do think there's probably some automation either in the mix or in the master to, to lift the choruses up, as Drew has suggested. But maybe this is just how the final result looks in terms of those peak levels. In terms of the levels themselves, I'm actually also curious about what Drew was seeing. He explained in his video that he was using the Apple Music M4A files. So these are lossy data encoded files rather than 
the lossless originals. My capture here is lossless, and I'm not seeing such a big peak discrepancy. Drew suggested it was somewhere between half a dB to a dB, which is quite a big difference. But the difference I'm seeing here is only 0.35 of a dB. It's noticeable visually, but it's pretty subtle. And now I've made changes of half a dB and less sometimes when I'm mastering to get the maximum benefit from the dynamics in a song. So again, I don't think this disproves Drew's idea at all, but I'm curious why Drew saw a larger discrepancy, and I suspect that may be because of the lossy data encoding. As I showed in some of my videos on intersample peaks and true peak limiters, when files with a particular peak level get encoded to formats like AAC, MP3, OGVORBIS, the data encoded formats that the streaming services use, almost always the peak levels change. They are, I would say, inflated artificially. You see extra little bursts of peak information that weren't there in the original file simply because of the data encoding. And if they're very high, that, in my opinion, can be a problem because they could get clipped further down the stream by the decoder or the player. I won't go into that now, but if you're interested, you can dig into those videos. I'll put a link below the video so you can follow up on that whole rabbit hole thought process. But that brings me to a more general point, which is another video I made recently, Stop Paying Attention to Peak Levels. I'm not suggesting that Drew did anything wrong by looking at the peak levels in this case, but I do think we need to be careful for all of these reasons. There are multiple explanations for why things can happen. Peak levels can change because of processing further down the line. As interesting as this stuff is, I think we have to be careful about how far we can draw conclusions from it. As another example, I could imagine potentially that the mix of this track might have had some kind of particularly soft clipping included on maybe a drum bus or an instrumental bus somewhere. And that again, what we're seeing here is not necessarily the result of the mastering engineer choosing to automate anything or even the mix engineer. It's just how the peaks happen to look based on the different elements of the song coming in. If you have certain tracks that have one set of processing on them and then you reach another part of the song where other tracks come into the arrangement and they have slightly different processing, it wouldn't surprise me for the peak levels for those to be slightly different as they are in this case and we would see this as a result. And one final possible explanation for all of this is that it's quite simply just a last minute artist request for an alteration and a little level shift was the quickest way to achieve that. So, oh, can we have a little bit more contrast between the verse and the chorus? Yes, I can just gain down everything else. Now, I would be surprised if that's the case, because when people are trying to get things super loud, as they typically are these days, and this is a loud master, every half dB counts. And think about all the objections to true peak limiting. Most of those come from the fact that true peak limiting just adds a little bit more gain reduction maybe half a dB or a dB at some points. So when everybody is worried so much about those tiny extra increases in limiting, I would be very surprised if the choice was made to accept more limiting through the rest of the song when it wasn't really necessary for the sake of an extra 0.3 dB or whatever it is at the loudest moments. I'd be surprised by that. Even if it was an artist request, I would normally expect the adjustment to be made prior to the limiter. So, as I say, we have no way of knowing which of these is the real explanation for what we're seeing here, and it's certainly fun to think about why. I guess I would just urge caution. If you want to try the technique that Drew is suggesting, then by all means do it. I just think it's more likely to be because of a desire to bring some extra dynamics in there that weren't actually present in the original mix. And we're just seeing a side effect of that rather than a particular strategy by the mastering engineer. And you might well be asking, regardless of all of this, why not simply ask for a mix revision? And again, I have no way of knowing, but very common explanations for that would simply be lack of time. I think that's the most likely. Uh, you know, the song has to be released tomorrow. The mastering is happening at the last minute. There isn't time to go back for a mix revision and for, you know, half a dB or so of gain change. 
probably not necessarily worth it. Could be, it's unlikely to be lack of budget, but, you know, certainly could be lack of availability for the studio. Everybody, of course, tries to accommodate last minute changes as best they can. But again, if this was happening late in the process, I can imagine that would not be an option. So, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me at all that this was a decision made at the mastering stage. I suspect it's a pragmatic decision rather than a strategy, though. And my advice generally is use all the peak headroom you've got, especially if you're being asked to make super loud masters and use a good deal of limiting. Every half dB can count in certain situations. And I'm not convinced that the practical, audible difference between automating before or after when it's a change like this would make a huge amount of difference and if it's a bigger change of 2 or 3 dB I think it would almost certainly be better to make that change prior to the limiter. I guess if the limiter was really contributing to the way that the music sounded and with the gain increase that might be an argument but personally I'd still prefer to achieve that in some other way. Anyway it's certainly fun to speculate about this stuff and Hopefully there's something in there that you might find interesting to add to what Drew has already uh, pointed out about this song and the others. I certainly encourage you to check out his video if you're interested. And yeah, let me know what you think about my suggestions here. Do you think Drew was on the money and I'm way off the mark? Or do you think my suggestion sounds more plausible? I'm curious to know what you think. Let me know in the comments. And if you enjoyed this video, I think you will also love a free PDF I've put together. It's called the Home Mastering Guide, and it covers what I think are the six essential steps to releasing your music with complete confidence. As I say, it's just a simple PDF. It's completely free, and you can get your copy at homemasteringguide.com. My name is Ian Shepherd. Thanks for listening.